What up YouTube, Patrick here, and today I want to talk about spam because it's been in the nano news a lot lately. So first let's get into some basics. So as everyone knows, nano has no transaction fees. If I send you 1.1 nano, you receive 1.1 nano. Now that does not mean that nano has no cost because how else do you prevent people from spamming the network, right? Otherwise I could just send millions and millions of transactions, clog up your hard drive, clog up the network. And that's where proof of work comes in. It's basically just a mathematical guessing game to prove that you've put some time and effort into your transaction and that it has some value being transferred. Uh, here you can see a picture of a block or the fields inside of a block and one of those fields is work. And proof of work is kind of hard to create but easy to verify which makes it perfect for a system like Nano in the place of a transaction fee. In Nano's case, proof of work is typically pre-computed meaning that when you hit send on your wallet, the transaction is broadcast instantly because the proof of work was already done. And then w once you hit send, the proof of work for the next transaction starts to be done in the background. And that's really nice because normal humans aren't sending hundreds of transactions right, up, right after each other. It's usually maybe a couple transactions a day, a few minutes apart, sometimes days apart, so on and so forth. So that kind of matches how humans make transactions, right? Whereas a bot or a script that's doing proof of work or that's trying to do transactions constantly will have to keep doing proof of work over and over at that point of time, which kind of slows them down. Currently, proof of work can be done client side yourself on your own machine if you have the right wallet. Or more typically, if you're using Natrium or Nalt, one of those like a mobile wallet, they usually outsource the POW to a system like distributed proof of work, DPOW or BoomPOW or P2P POW is a, a new one or P2POW, and they can do that. They're basically subsidizing the POW cost for you because one, it's pretty cheap for them, and two, the a lot of mobile app stores consider POW to be mining and against their store policy, so there's kind of some restrictions there. But anyways, that's the basics of Nano and Proof of Work. So let's get into some of the spam-related activity from recently. What are the concerns? The, the biggest concerns are saturation, uh, where the attacker does so much transactions that the network is clogged, right? And it takes longer for you to make your own transactions. Basically, the network is full. Uh, uh, then another concern is ledger bloat, right? If they're making millions of transactions, are they filling up hard drives and making it basically more expensive to run a node? Uh, potentially fees, because like we just talked about, services typically subsidize the proof of work effectively for usually mobile apps or mobile nano wallets. And if the POW costs go up, does that make it more difficult for them to subsidize? Could be. Uh, centralization is another concern, mostly tied to the ledger bloat piece. If the ledger size gets too big and uses up too much hard drive space, then it becomes too costly and only a few people can run a node, theoretically, right? Uh, not everyone can afford terabytes of storage. Uh, another potential issue is just naturally improving hardware, Moore's Law, right? Uh, every year new graphics cards come out that makes it easier and easier to do a proof of work, at least the base proof of work. Another concern for some people is distributed denial of service or just regular denial of service uh, in combination with other maybe attack vectors. Like maybe you DDoS a bunch of, of nano nodes to try and uh, double spend or something. Could that be a spam related concern for some people? Yes, but we'll, we'll talk about the mitigations and answers to these and also potential fu potential future solutions to some of these. Uh, also for reference before I take a look at this chart, um, I did the math based on average US uh, electricity prices and a 1080 Ti which is formerly a top top end graphics card. Now it's probably mid to high since it's about two generations back. But doing the math for that, uh, you could basically get 5,500 proof of work for one dollar assuming you've already paid for the graphics card and you're just doing it at cost. Uh, which comes out to basically two one-hundredths of a penny per transaction. So pretty low, but that gives you some idea of what we're working with. So that is a cost, right? But it's not particularly high. So an attacker with hundreds of dollars or thousands or millions of dollars could spend the money to do a lot of proof of work, right? Is that a concern? Uh, and so this has come up... Actually, I'm just going to skip to the next slide because it has this a little bit bigger. So... One of the concerns lately has been Nano has been under repeated spam attack. Normally we hover at maybe under 10 confirmations per second, but lately we've been hitting 100, 150, 200 in constant bursts 
And when you look at those transactions, they're basically zero value transactions, like one raw, which there's 10 to the 30 raw in a single nano. It's a, I don't know how to describe that number, but it's massive. Um, but so they're doing a very, very, very small amount of nano. And they're just spamming thousands and thousands of transactions. Uh, you might have seen one of my Twitter posts where they dropped 60,000 blocks transactions in like 10 minutes, basically. So nano is repeatedly being hit by these spam attacks lately. So what's the actual impact and what, what's the concern? Or, or the concern that we talked about before, how much is it really impacting Nano? So I'm going to walk through all these different charts. Shout out to Nano Ticker for these, which is, they're very beautiful <laughs> and a great, a great helps in visualizing what's going on. So this top chart is the total number of transactions. We're here at the time of the screenshot, there were 64,900,000 blah, 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 Nano transactions total. But you can see these little jumps here, these little bumps that coincide with when the spam happens because boom, they've dumped another 10,000, 100,000 transactions on the network that the network has, has to process and the total number of transactions goes up. Here, this chart is the one that we probably wanna focus on and it shows the uh, blocks per second, BPS, so how fast the attacker is actually just broadcasting out transactions versus CPS, how fast the network is confirming transactions. So you can see here that there was a spike at like 150, 175, maybe 200 BPS. And then a little bit while, a little while later, CPS was at over 100. So at first glance, some people get concerned by the gap between BPS and CPS. Because that means, okay, a bunch of transactions are dumped on the network, but they're not processed immediately. And that's partially true, but there's some caveats here. Um, one is... Almost by physics, there's a limit to how many transactions per second a single account can do. Because it takes 250 milliseconds normally for a transaction to confirm, and you can't confirm the second transaction in a chain before the first one, right? You have to do the first one, then the second one, then the next one, because they're chained together. That limits you to about four transactions per second per account. So what do attackers do to get around that? Well, they create hundreds of accounts, stage them with a little bit of nano, and then they make transactions so that they can increase the total transactions per second. Uh, and that's partially what's happening here. Even when they make thousands of accounts, though, usually they're, they're not one-to-one -one mapping the accounts to spam, so there's still a little bit of a discrepancy between BPS and CPS. Of course, the other reason for a discrepancy between BPS and CPS is when the network hits saturation, right? The, uh, for reference, the nano network in prod, the main net, can do between 160 to 240 CPS before it hits saturation. Somewhere in that range, because it varies by type of spam, number of nodes out there, hardware on the nodes, but somewhere in that range, once you hit that, uh, the network as a whole starts to slow down. This is pretty similar to Bitcoin and its mempool, right? Where... An attacker could send a whole bunch of zero, va zero fee transactions, they fill up the mempool, and then people have to start paying higher and higher fees. Or they could do one cent Bitcoin fees to fill up the mempool even more and push the fees higher. Same concept for nano, but with proof of work. So in most cases, the goal or the hope is to stay below saturation so that everyone's transaction, all the legitimate people's transactions process normally. But with enough proof of work and a motivated enough attacker, you can hit saturation. And that's just a fundamental limit of you, you have this much available network capacity, CPU, memory, hard disk, whatever the constraints are, and humans, attackers, spammers, even legitimate users are always going to try to use as much of that as possible at some point, right? So that's where pushing scalability becomes really important for nano and really any cryptocurrency. I guess so moving on to some of the other charts, this is an important chart to keep an eye on just because it gives an idea if the network is saturated or not. Another important one is this block confirmation time. As you can see, we usually hover around less than 500 milliseconds, uh, I think 250 milliseconds average according to this, or 270, something like that, with some spikes whenever there's a spam attack. Um, but there are some caveats with this chart because this takes all transactions into account, including the attacker spam, which has to be uh, has to be confirmed in order. Remember, so if there's like the tenth transaction in the attacker's chain, and we're waiting on the first nine, 
that increases the average, even though in reality, for most people, legitimate users, their transaction times are still at 200 milliseconds. And you can see that in this bottom right chart here. So this chart shows the nano ticker node makes repeated health check tra transactions, basically, from Germany to no Norway, and it times those transactions. So normally, and even during spam, you can see even during these spikes, it's still around 200 milliseconds, maybe 400 milliseconds. We'll, I'll show a different graph in the future. Um, however, when we really hit saturation, that's when this, uh, this chart or these transactions also start to climb. So when the network is truly maxed out, essentially, normal transactions start to get affected more and more. So here you see we spike to seven seconds, basically. Uh, here it was like two seconds uh, for these test transactions. So how do we combat that? Well, that's where dynamic proof of work and proof of work prioritization come in. And I'll talk more about that in a future slide. An attacker usually computes their proof of work at the base level, right? Because they want as many transactions as possible, as cheaply as possible to fill up the network. A normal human user can easily do proof of work plus one, like a little bit more difficulty to move to the front of the line. And that's usually what users and services do during a saturation event. And that's basically, in my view, that's going to be the biggest long-term solution to spam is basically making it so that normal users aren't really affected during saturation. That's how Bitcoin works, right? Even when the mempool is full and fees are $10 plus, if you pay a $15 fee, you get moved to the front of the line and you're right in that next block, that next... Uh, batch of confirmations, right? And that's basically what Nano is mimicking, but with proof of work. However, over these last few days, there have been some issues with proof of work um, prioritization. And this is not a new issue. It wasn't just um, discovered because of the spam. It's a, a long-term known issue. And the devs improve the proof of work prioritization every patch, basically, or every new release. Because the, the challenge is, Different nodes can receive transactions at different times, and when you're when the network is saturated, it's difficult for everyone to communicate what transaction they want to confirm right at the same time, right? So it takes some work and some tuning to get better and better, and they're going to continue focusing on that. So those are probably the four charts that you care about most here on this chart. Of course, there's we have max versus average, uh, and this chart is kind of interesting. This is one that I liked to keep an eye on with older node releases because what would happen during high spam events is some nodes would actually crash or die and fall off the network. But as you can see here, even during the spam, the number of nodes stays pretty flat. There's a little bit of variance, which is expected from a few nodes that maybe run out of storage or uh, they don't have enough specs to keep up and they fall off the network, but they're not truly crashing. They're just slowing down. In most cases, they're just slowing down until they can resync back up. Um, but what's interesting with this particular graph is notice this huge spike of nodes to a thousand nodes. Just briefly, that could be a sign of a Sybil attack where someone is trying to spin up a ton of nodes to see if they can impact the network some way. Uh, that doesn't affect Nano really because of open representative voting and the, the weight required to confirm transactions. So just spinning up more nodes doesn't make make it easier for you to try and process a, or try and confirm a bad transaction. But it, that is just an interesting observation here. So here's zooming into one of those spikes. We can look at it a little bit more. In this case, there's a gap between BPS and CPS at the beginning, which could be one, the natural limitation of account-based spam, right? If the spammer didn't create enough accounts, then their, their TPS or CPS is effectively capped. But it could also be, and it probably is here, that the network hit saturation at this point. So like 175-ish, it looks like, maybe. We hit saturation, and so the attacker was spamming BPS, but the network couldn't quite keep up, so CPS was a little bit lower. Then as the spam dropped, like right here where it crosses over, the network starts catching up because it has resources again. And notice that, again, connected peers is pretty flat. That's a good sign. No nodes are like dying or crash, crashing off the network. And also notice that, for the most part, everyone else's transactions, normal transactions, are still in that 200 to 400 millisecond range. However, there is a spike when saturation is having issues, and this particular node had to wait 25 seconds for their transaction to be confirmed, which is high, 
but it's also this is Nano doing pretty good at handling the spam and recovering, right? There's always going to be an upper limit. There's always going to be a time or a point where you hit saturation, and that's when confirmation times climb. Now, keep in mind, though, of course, this is still many orders of magnitudes faster than Bitcoin, even under the spam attack, so that's a good sign. But this is something that could be improved and will need continued focus on. Uh, here's another spam attack from recent times, but notice this time the BPS and CPS pretty much matches, meaning the network probably didn't hit saturation. And again, you can see that confirmation times didn't really climb for anyone in this case. This looks like a big spike, but the, the scale has shifted from 200 milliseconds to like 400 milliseconds. So still extremely fast transactions for almost everybody. Uh, even at the, the broader um, median block confirmation times, which remember includes the attacker's transactions that were waiting on the ordering, the ordering starts to play a role. Uh, even then, the median is still, what, 300 milliseconds. It does climb to like eight seconds, but that's probably mostly on the attacker or the spammer's account. So not bad. That's, that's the current state of the network. We can never truly solve spam, right? DDoS and spam has been an internet problem since the beginning of time. But we can make it so that, one, the cost to the spammer is high enough that it's not really worth the effort. Um, at the same time, though, you can't really make the cost so high that it affects legitimate users, the, at least at the base, because then, then what's the point? But I think it's possible to find a balance between the, the time and effort it takes a spammer versus the gain they get out of it, right? If we, if we nail proof-of-work prioritization and make it so that any time a legitimate user does a little bit more power, they're, they're actually at the front of the line and processed instantly, then the spammer is spamming for no nothing, right? They're maybe bloating the ledger a little bit. They're wasting some resources. But at the end of the day, it's not really having an impact. Uh, Nano has gotten better over the releases, but we're not quite there yet. So that's something that the devs are aware of and they have focus on. If you want to participate in the conversations, check out the official forum discussions or Discord where this has been discussed countless times and Colin LeMay, who and the rest of the Nano Foundation are aware of it and they're making progress in that direction. So recapping the current solutions, we have dynamic proof of work and proof of work prioritization, which like I said, can, can always be improved. Uh, pruning is coming. It's actively in the beta network uh, and will help for the storage cost piece of things. It doesn't solve every issue because, for example, the attacker can send transactions to a bunch of different accounts instead of the same account, and that's a lot harder to prune. Um, but also Moore's Law already, as is, plays a role. Uh, Viren, Viren, I don't know how to pronounce his name, uh, published a Google Sheets calculator that you can play with. I'll put a link to in the description. Uh, where even if you don't include pruning, shows that Moore's Law alone, okay, Moore's Law is the, the argument or the theory that every 18 to 24 months, computing resources basically double. Um, storage, memory, CPU, so on and so forth. And that's held true for many years with a little bit of deviations, but more or less that's the case. So using that alone, Viren created this calculator that shows that in the short term, yes, storage storage costs jump up a little bit, but even without pruning, Moore's Law brings those back in line to something that's affordable for most people. <clears throat> uh, there's also, so on the, the user side, the user experience side, there's distributed proof of work, which is different from dynamic proof of work. Remember, dynamic proof of work is when the proof of work thresholds change from like base level of one to a two times multiplier, five times multiplier. That's something different. Distributed proof of work is a system that a lot of apps like Natrium or mobile-based wallets use to offload their proof of work uh, because they can have you can have multiple GPUs, multiple people contributing to that service, and it costs the wallet minimal amounts. So remember, so I did the math, and at cost, if you're using U average U.S. electricity prices, is 13.9 cents per kilowatt hour. That's two one hundredths of a penny. Per transaction and that doesn't even account for uh, people who have much cheaper electricity across costs across the world and they can contribute to these services so the theory is that as nano gets more used as these services scale because they have more users they're able to monetize more and they're able to continue subsidizing the pow cost maybe that's not always the case but of course you could always do your own proof of work if you really want to contribute your own pc's work or you can pay a fee that's an option um, and then don't forget 
even as is, a one terabyte hard drive costs about $100. So if you're running your own local node, like in your house or in your own data center, like maybe Binance might run their own node, uh, you could get 2 billion transactions effectively for $100. What does that equate to? 115 days of straight 200 confirmations per second, which the attackers haven't got close to because that's that's a much higher cost. So that will shut out some low-end hobby nodes, but remember that Nano doesn't need everyone to run a node to be decentralized. We just need enough nodes and enough distribution that it's infeasible to collude or um, try to double spend all those attack thresholds. So for example, imagine you had 100 billionaires all running their own nano node, right? Because they want access to the digital gold standard uh, that is nano. While yes, that may be kind of less decentralized than today where we have hobby nodes, it's still pretty decentralized because you have 100 unique entities participating in consensus. Kind of like Bitcoin mining pools right now. There's like three or four big mining pools that make up the majority of uh, Bitcoin's consensus percentage or distribution. And it's still decentralized because you have that separation. What about future solutions? Because this doesn't solve everything as, we, as we've seen. There's still a little bit of concern with prioritization, uh, with hitting saturation, how cheap it is for an attack or so on and so forth. Uh, so what can we do? Well, there's dynamic proof of work and power prioritization optimization that can constantly happen, uh, and it is happening. The V22 beta includes some of these changes, and it's probably going to continue forever, right? You can always tweak things to make it a little better. Um, pruning can get a little better and more granular. So the basic level of pruning is just one block per account. You just need the latest confirmed transaction for every account, right? But you can get much more aggressive than that. You can say, even for pending transactions, those ones that are hard to prune in the traditional way, maybe we don't need the POW field to be stored on the database after we've confirmed it, right? After we've logged it on our node, maybe we can strip that to save some space. Maybe there's, um, yeah, there's different things that you can play with, right? And you can check out the official forums for a lot of discussion and brainstorming on this. Um, along those same lines, there's also different kinds of proof of work we could do. We could say maybe for uh, lower transaction sizes, you increase the proof of work. We have to be careful of this because we want Nano to be accessible to the whole world, right? But there's different variables like that we can play with. Uh, something that XRP does, and we could brainstorm and, or consider, is minimum account balances. Maybe you need to have 20 Nano in account. Okay, that sounds way too high, but in theory, you could consider those things. I, I personally don't like the minimum account balance thing, but you could play with the right balance and maybe come to a solution that node operators would agree on. A big one for me that I would like to see is pre-computing limits, because most of the spam attacks we're seeing right now are not from GPUs actively running in parallel, because that's kind of costly. Like You actually have to have 10 GPUs constantly doing proof of work, whereas now you can have one GPU and it just computes for a few hours and then dumps it all at once. So maybe we make it so that every hour or every day you have to do a new kind of proof of work. So even if you pre-computed before, it gets canceled effectively and you have to do new pre uh, new proof of work um, to kind of help mitigate some type of spam. There, Of course, with all of these things, there's some implementation issues. They may not be feasible. Others may be feasible or there could be pushback see the forums for discussion. There's a lot of smart minds working on this. There's a lot of potential solutions and we'll probably and we'll probably need a combination of them, but uh, that's something to keep in mind. And then one, something that Colin mentioned that caused a lot of drama and concern was legal action. So I want to stress that legal action is not the solution and it won't work in most cases. And a lot of people don't like to see it. They think, oh, it's an open decentralized network, let people spam, which is true to some extent. But if you already know the limits of the network, you're not gaining much out of just spamming it over and over again, right? But, okay, for argument's sake, we'll say let people spam. What could happen, and is one of many uh, potential mitigations, not the mitigation, um, is that some services who are using Nano as a backbone, say maybe Visa or Natrium or whatever, if they are measur measurably impacted by spam and the spammer has said, hey, I'm spamming to take down the network, something like that. There is historical court precedent, depending on your jurisdiction, where they can be sued and um, 
action is taken against them. Of course, that's not the solution. We shouldn't rely on that. These other things are much more important. But that is a valid action that some people can take in the certain circumstances. That's something that can be used as, as a deterrent for some people, right? Blizzard actually did this before when they were being constantly DDoSed by uh, some spammer or attackers. They found one, they took him to court, and they won the court case because the spammer said, I'm doing this to harm the network effectively. Or, or the, even if they didn't say it, there was en enough evidence that that happened. But of course, like I said, that won't work in most cases the spammer's not going to tell you i'm doing this to hurt the network there's not going to be evidence you won't know who it is and the network should be resilient right one note though what does resilient mean nano it's almost impossible to guarantee in every certain circumstance that legitimate users will always have less than one second transaction times it's just not possible physics comes into play even credit card networks in the past have had issues right where you go to the store and like oh sorry our machine is down now, we don't want that for Nano, and we want to be as scalable as possible, as resilient as possible. But as long as Nano nodes don't crash and they can catch up, that is our real goal. And we should make it as difficult as possible for spammers to affect legitimate users. Uh, one concern that some um, people bring up with ledger bloating is bootstrapping, right? If you have a huge ledger, it becomes more and more difficult to catch up or if you're starting a fresh node to actually sync the whole ledger and verify transactions for yourself. So one thing that's kind of unique to Nano is because of the block lattice data structure and because of open representative voting, you really only need the most recent confirmed transaction, roughly, there's some caveats, but the most recently confirmed transaction in every blockchain to con continuously and trustlessly validate transactions on the network. Uh, what I mean, What I mean by that is when a transaction comes in, you compare it against the previous most recent transaction and say, oh, is the amount being transferred valid? Is the proof of work valid? Blah, blah, blah. Is it, does it look good, right? If it looks good and it gets confirmed, that new transaction becomes the latest transaction and you can basically get rid of the old one, right? And then you keep doing that so you're only storing that one transaction per account. So in theory, what you could do is have a form of bootstrapping where you straight up reach out to the representatives and just pull the latest version, and you confirm those, right? You ask all the different um, uh, representatives up front, which this causes some, some people don't like this idea because they think it's not really trustless, not trustless enough, because you, you have to kind of hard code some uh, representatives up front. But I'll, I'll, I'll ask people to remember that the only thing that really matters in a, decentralized payment network is that you're able to pay and transact with whoever you want to transact with, right? If I'm trying to transact with you, you have an incentive to give me the valid ledger, right? And even if you gave me a bad ledger, the worst that would happen is we would be on separate parallel networks from the real nano network, right? It'd be like banana versus nano. Um, so it would be different balances. If you made a transaction on one network, it wouldn't affect the other. So really it's like a temporary delay at worst. Because eventually you'll find, oh, I'm on the wrong network, let me go to the real network, and so on and so forth. That's why I think top-down bootstrapping could be a good solution for the um, bootstrap sync issue. And of course, giving more scalability to Nano is another potential solution, especially in combination with everything else, right? The, the higher the CPS limits are for the network, the more difficult it is for an attacker to hit saturation and affect everyone else. So optimizations there, which there's some interesting discussion on, again, the forum, Reddit, Discord, um, optimizations there can push Nano a, a long ways. So anyways, this has been a long video. I'll stop it there. Uh, hopefully that helped you. Free, feel free to ask me questions. Uh, I think maybe in the future, there might be some interest in just having a, a live stream or a community panel where we just discuss and brainstorm and talk about what's happening what issues are, so on and so forth. So I'll consider that. Uh, if you made it to this point in the video, let me know. I'd be quite surprised if anyone does. But uh, as always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, let me know. Peace.